the idea for this talk was uh, during our last retreat in November when we visited the Atom Museum in the Czech Republic. And um, at that time we asked Bob, Bob would you like to give us a talk about this presentation. So this is why we have Bob here today. For those of you who don't know Bob as well as I do, uh, Bob has, if you look at his Cipri TV on the Cipri website, he has uh, worked uh, in the U.S. nuclear weapons program for many years, at least 35 years experience in that. Not only that, uh, Bob also worked in the, uh, for the uh, Iraq action team twice, or uh, Invo, first action team and Invo. Uh, I had the honor to work under him, he was my senior inspector in OB2 for a couple of years before he moved somewhere else. Um, Bob retired a couple of years ago and he's now a well-respected writer, consultant, <laughs> analyst. You, uh, you can often uh, watch him on the Al Jazeera, uh, BBC, um, what was this? Where did I see you in your yeah. 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 all kinds of, uh, so whenever there's a, a, an experienced opinion needed, uh, people turn to Bob. So it's really a great honor to have Bob here today. And um, anyway, I'm a pacifist. I think there shouldn't be a nuclear weapon in this world. That is why I identify myself with the work of the agency um, and with the spirit of the NPT. And I do hope one day the objective of the world without nuclear weapons will be achieved because I think we should not destroy each other and if those bombs explode. If, if, if a couple of them detonate today, I think half of the world will be extinguished But anyway, if you are going to tell us about the age of nuclear testing, so maybe we don't need all those tests anymore, and just... Okay. As I said, one day, I wish that... Sorry, Bob. Well, our war has to see if they would survive the uh, Soviet enemy. Uh, it was my first job. Out of college. Um, wasn't underground testing, but that's what I'm going to talk about today. But I've been around the underground testing business for a long time and have a, a, a good feeling about it. The presentations that I have, I have quite a number of them now, uh, I have developed primarily for the Swedish Radiation Protection Authority in Stockholm. And they uh, pay me to go to Russia, Ukraine, Georgia, uh, places like that to lecture to their university students. On, uh, on proliferation. And as you can guess, this does not look like a good year for lecturing to students in Russia and Ukraine uh, and elsewhere. I'm, I'm disappointed because what we were doing was very positive, speaking to young people about non proliferation. And last year, uh, for the first time, I had a group of technical students. And they wanted to know more technical things, not just you know, what is the IAEA, what is the additional protocol, those kinds of things I lecture on all the time. But they asked me to come up with some things that were more technical. And I thought this was a good one because it's easy to illustrate, it's interesting, and I'm going to talk um, quite a bit about technical aspects of testing. And maybe what you'll see as we finally get to the end is uh, because of the lack of testing, the nuclear weapons programs are starting to disintegrate. Uh, that's one of the reasons they're disintegrating. And so maybe what you're hoping for is going to happen not because diplomats do the right thing, but because people who are building things can't build them for a reasonable price anymore. The U.S. cannot build a facility anymore for the, for the price they say they'll do it. And, and the huge cost of are really So let me talk about testing. And I'm going to talk about testing, not about why testing is evil or why we shouldn't do it, but why people did do it and what they get out of it. And maybe what you'll see as we go through it is how it is beginning to erode for various reasons. I will acknowledge my association with the Stockholm International Peace Research at this point. Um, they were very helpful to me. Um, so the first thing is that I think anybody who's been in this business realizes that these are very complex things. They're not tests. Maybe way back in the very early days, people did tests just to see if things worked and, and didn't make very many variables. But in today's world, the clearly how the testing ended uh, for the major states in 1991, these experiments that they were doing with 
cost something like fifteen hundred million dollars. Very, very uh, large activities. Very complex management systems. And the first thing happens is it's actually the second. So everything has to work uh, correctly, has to work correctly the first time. You don't get a second choice, second chance, or in the of just um, to say a little try that again. Uh, and the effects of weapons in general are very rapid. You can say there are things like radiation afterwards, but the blast and the heat and, and the pump radiation are also over in the of the So people have to be very good at making weapons. Uh, this is an example of what a test looked like at the development site uh, back before this was ended. And as you can see, there are hundreds of cables that go to the device. Uh, only one of them is there to make the device go off. That's the signal that tells you work. The rest of it is not. People want to measure radiation, they want to measure neutrons, gammas, x rays. Uh, they do all kinds of very sophisticated measurements down there, not only the spectrum, but on the tail. So the device is in that tall building with the lower down shaft. You can see it there, uh, the paint from the crane, the white object, and all those cables go down. The whole back and forth. So the radiation can't escape, and then it's And I, I wanted to show that picture, and then I'll ask you this question, because this is a current event on the talk. Why did I show you that? There are just kinds of things, particularly on the arms control walk and elsewhere, that are reviewing the Brazilians that they're testing for. So we're talking about what was Brazil doing back in the uh, period of what 1991. And People in Brazil are walking back now from admitting there was a nuclear program, a nuclear weapons program. There were two test holes there. And in the 90s, they agreed that these test holes were for a nuclear test. Now the same people who admitted that in those years are saying, well, that really wasn't there. There was water in the bottom of the hole. There were no cables there. There was no infrastructure. You see, those no cables didn't come right from the very end. So the people who are making these statements are. They're trying to walk back politically and not admit the facility. So they've been split in every time. The national was in the beginning. They were down on the surface. I believe that's the only test there. Then they went underground because of tree and safety reasons. And so that's a rather complex experiment. See all those cables laid out on the ground again. In fact, those cables are an interesting intelligence indicator because the, the yield of the bomb is <coughs> But you have to burn the bomb at a certain depth so it doesn't blow out. And the satellite people could just look at those cables and land on the whole must be that deep. So uh, intelligence likes nuclear testing because you can see it. In, in, in North Korea, it's still been very helpful in understanding what they're doing. They've been done underwater. They've been done for a very long time. We've been done in outer space. And in outer space, it's a major problem because if someone were to detonate a nuclear device in uh, outer space today, it would kill all of these satellites. It's so dependent upon it. First, there would be the explosion itself, but the real problem would be all these charged particles in this thing in the field would just light out all the satellites. So that hasn't been done for a very long time. <coughs> this is what it looks like before it goes into the ground. Naturally, the U.S. has most of the pictures and descriptions. But the bomb is down at the bottom of that container, and all of those other things are lines of sight, looking at x rays, neutrons, and gamma rays, to understand what is going on in there. And then it all gets vaporized in a very short time. So um, it's, it's a very complex experiment again, and that, that canister with all those things are worth millions of dollars of equipment and time. They also do horizontal tests. <coughs> Horizontal tests are usually the kind the military likes. The military likes horizontal tests because you can dig a tunnel, and then people can walk in the tunnel and make set up experiments and do all sorts of things. You can, uh, because you can no longer test in the atmosphere, uh, if you want to irradiate tanks or satellites or things like that, you, you make this long tunnel and you put the bomb at one end and you set all these things there to see what happens to them. So these are usually what they call effects tests. And the other reason you do horizontal tests is particularly for countries like, say, North Korea, it's much, much easier to dig a tunnel into a mountain than it is to dig a very deep shaft that's been in this thing. That technology is just not there in those countries. Um, in India, they did test the shaft 
And they, they see all these tunnels up and uh, <coughs> so it won't make radi radiation. But they actually go back into the tunnel afterwards and collect the things that they left in there and see what happens to them. They, they reuse these tunnels. And here's, here's an example of what it looks like in the tunnel. And you can see it in, in the valley. And in, in Russia, the Bible and in the Arctic. It really looks pretty much the same. And what those pipes are is that it's a very long pipe and they evacuate it. They pump all the air out of it so that they can simulate outer space. So the bomb might be a kilometer down the tunnel, far, far away from the experiment, but the experiment, which is maybe a satellite sitting in that orange container, sees radiation coming down the pipe as if it's in outer space. So this is one of the things that people have to do to accommodate the limited test penetry, which said you can no longer test on the water in outer space or on the surface. You see, these treaties do begin to squeeze the scientists and they are effective at beginning to prevent people from doing more and more. So, uh, what can you just remind me? When was the treaty? No, no, the treaty was in 1963. It was right after. It was right after the moratorium between mm -hmm. the U.S. and the uh, was like so in the So, when was the last nuclear test? Uh, the, the, um, uh, in, in the normal environment, I mean, uh, like we have the ones in Rajasthung. I don't remember the early 50s. I don't remember the early 50s. I think the French were testing into the late 60s in the atmosphere. There is one exception to that, and that is the so called peaceful nuclear explosions that we're going to talk about. And those explosions for making canals and craters and things like that. Um, there, there was release of radiation into the environment uh, because the holes were intentionally not deep enough to contain the shock. The people really thought they could build canals. Uh, they were going to dig a new Panama Canal using nuclear explosives, and people were, I think, mean, really dig a rock up said, You're going to what? Sure, they just sail off the stream and get the nuclear explosives across the isthmus. I don't know. The military people might think of a test. So they wanted to see way back in the 1950s that it would knock down the house, it would blow up the bridge, and things like that. But um, that's kind of a military mentality. We always used to call that the admiral's test. The admiral just wants to know to push the button on the But the scientists really want to know how the bomb will form and if it performs in a reasonable way. There are other things that you need to look at, like the electromagnetic pulse from the bomb, which can destroy our bombs on the surface for satellites in space. And those become very difficult to do. And because they haven't tested in outer space since about 1963, they actually don't have a clue what's going to happen. They actually don't have a clue. And so you hear about electromagnetic faults destroying all of our electronics that we have. And if you know, somebody shoots a, a bomb 100 miles over your head, you don't feel any blast or heat or anything else. It's just all the electronics stop working. But they don't have any really good data. In 1963, we didn't have handy computers and things. Uh, so, this is an area that's very, very important. Cool. The kind of measurements they want to make in the bomb are they want to see that fission primary. That's the thing that gets squeezed by explosives and, uh, and gives up a lot of radiation, which then throws the secondary and becomes a third nuclear bomb. This is a drawing that comes off the internet, fairly famous from uh, then they powered more ones to try to work out how thermonuclear bombs work. And the U.S. Department of Energy sued him to not publish what he had found, but he published his drawing anyway. And this was the first time that anybody had ever really shown what a thermonuclear bomb looked like. The round thing being the primary explosion that this is a few kilotons, and all that energy that is channeled down to feed that cylinder, uh, which is the thermonuclear bomb. So something that gives a few kilotons of fission in the primary field could give megatons of uh, That's what a thermal nuclear bomb looks like. And people are trying to make measurements of what's happening at all points inside that bomb. We want to know how did the primary work, what did it float it properly, what was the temperature that it exploded at, what was the timing, and then how did the radiation flow down around that uh, electrical secondary and squeeze it into the 
all kinds of new things we can do. We would be surprised to see 50 spectrometers in other instruments uh, measure things on the step. So again, it's complex. The PMEs I mentioned a moment ago, this is like Shadon and Galaxon. It's just one of the ones they can make a lake. So they uh, have put the ball in the ground, blew out the earth, left this, this nice circular uh, crater, then it's filled with water. They thought they could make canals, make harbors in places where the coastline wasn't good. The Russians actually used this as well as to put out oil well fires. Because the oil well is on fire, you can't get anywhere near it at the top. Drill down from the side, put a very small atomic bomb in there, squeeze off the well. Certainly, we remember seeing fires go away. Oh, yeah. We flew into Baghdad the first time, all of the Kuwait fires. They didn't miss them. Uh, one of the things that, that was done is they would find places like fracking today. They drill a hole, fire a nuclear explosive, and crack the earth for a very large distance, and then they could get natural gas to fill off uh, from that. So the problem is the gas is really high. So that didn't work out that well. Uh, India said their first nuclear test was a peaceful explosion. They, they hid their purposes under the banner of peaceful nuclear explosives because they used a reactor that Canada gave them uh, but it was to be only used for peaceful purposes. So they made peaceful plutonium and they made peaceful explosives and they all of them. Uh, that's an embarrassment to Canada and that uh, embarrassment to the most uh, The reason that PMEs are completely banned now, first is nobody really sees them. So they were they just by the vastness uh, of the treaties. And uh, I would point out that the Soviets were very active in this area. I think they fired about 50 peaceful nuclear explosions around their country. They've been done all over the world. I, I, I find it surprising <coughs> when you look at how much of the world has been close to a nuclear explosion at some time. Uh, they've been done almost everywhere. If you fly over the Nevada test site, you can see it from commercial airplanes flying from Las Vegas to. Uh, San Francisco area, for example, you see all of those craters out there. Those are not exploded out craters, they're actually craters that were created when the ground collapsed into the northern ocean. So I'll show you a picture of that later. But uh, they did hundreds of tests out there at home. The Russians tested primarily in two places, the Toscan Shah and the Vine uh, That was the main site. They did atmospheric tests up there, and then they went underground. the And there's still a lot of activity. There are still Russians going up there every summer and raiding the polar bears and doing something. Uh, Kazakhstan was the other side, so we thought it was an area that's badly contaminated now, and uh, there's all kinds of effort going to clean that site up, and we'll mention that in a minute about some of the safety issues. Uh, one of the things that you would hear there is a lot of the native Kazakhs went out there with their children after the Soviets left. And they would open these tunnels where it just had taken place and get the kids to crawl back in there and pull out all the scrap metal and take them on the kids. End of testing is not the end of the problems. So the French, of course, never did a test in France. Uh, they first they were controlling Algeria, so they used Algeria for atmosphere test and then went underground. Um, and then when they lost their opportunity to go to Algeria, then they moved to Moroa and that's Polynesia, and they were actually testing in lagoons underneath the salt water. Uh, so it shows, again, I come back to that Brazil story a minute ago, when they say there was water in the bottom of the hole in Brazil, it couldn't have been used for nuclear test, but it's obviously garbage. These guys drilled holes in salt water, put, put bombs down there, and did tests. So that is an interesting case. In one case, when they did one of these tests, the floor of the lagoon with the coral collapsed so much from the crater, the hole down low collapsed. Everything went into it because of the tsunami uh, and killed some of their own people in their own testing village on the line. So uh, there are hazards associated with it. And uh, I think an interesting geographic fact is the New Zealanders are very, very upset about Mororoa. The Australians are upset about Mororoa. They say this is not our neighborhood. But more of the is closer to Los Angeles than it is to Austin. Don't think of the South Pacific being that way. Nobody in Los Angeles is complaining about the residents from this. 
But a good part of the South Pacific is in the future. UK also never got around to testing in London or Brighton, but they uh, first cropped up uh, Australia. They did their first test there at Montebello uh, on ships, and then they moved to Maralinga, and Maralinga keeps getting cleaned up. Uh, they send people down there to clean Maralinga up as much as they can to have original land. And then the standards for radiation on the surface become tighter and they don't want to clean it up again. Some of my people want to work in the doubt that there's no sense in that involved with those kinds of activities. And ice cap was the last nuclear test that was scheduled to be done in the US. And that's what it looks like today. It never was finished. There are the cables laid out on the ground, the tape brush is going up through it. And presumably that will never be done. But the uh, United States posted all of the last British test, and they actually share a huge amount of information about what they bomb. British bombs are basically copies of the other China did about 40, started in the atmosphere, and they moved underground. They were very fond of the tunnel pad, um, but they, they subscribed to the treaty as well today. And Pakistan and India, of course, big problem. These were the first people to test after the major countries set stop. Major countries stopped in 91, I believe it was. France went a little beyond that, and then it stopped. And then in 1998, India decided to set off seven times. And that was more than the Pakistanis could stand. So India had done one in 1974 that was peaceful. And in 1998, they said no, they of 98, they said they were going to do uh, more tests. They actually didn't announce it, so it was kind of a surprise the CIA Three weeks later, Pakistan used the excuse of the Indian test to detonate. Some people say five. I believe it was actually two <coughs> tests. But they did one in the tunnel, and that's what the dust from that mountain was coming out. And they did another one in the vertical shaft, and that one leaked. And so some of the, the debris from that one got out, which is useful to intelligence. <coughs> North Korea, you have to keep this slide up to date. But Right now we're sitting in tree test, the last of ceremony in 2015. And then a lot of people thought they were going to test in the last weeks, but it hasn't happened. But there seems to be a, uh, a move in that direction. And there one of the things go back in the tunnel, which shows it's useful again for the intelligence people, because you can really see the dirt being moved, the camps dirt coming out, until we start putting concrete back in. So people with satellites are watching this and almost on the beta basis. I mentioned two countries that didn't um, use their test sites. One was Austria. Uh, we went there in 93. Uh, IAEA did. Uh, the Americans were chipped off by the Soviets in 1977 that the uh, South Africans were up to something. Out in the Kalahari Desert. And the Soviets were supporting Angola and Cuban troops that were attacking South Africa. And the U.S. was opposed to South Africa because of apartheid and sanctions, but they were actually kind of free. And so the Russian Soviet said to the Americans, you go tell them to stop. And the Americans did tell them to stop. And when we were interviewing the South Africans later, um, and talking to them, they said, we were in the field. And we got a call from Pretoria that said, come home tomorrow. Close that thing up and come home. So they did. So there are two shafts down there. And we, the IADA, observed them filling the shafts with sand, and concrete, and debris, so those shafts <coughs> no longer exist. I, I like to tell this story, and I think we have the time. There, there's a strange thing about closing up the hole. If you want to close up these holes in South Africa, it's symbolic, it's also useful, and it's in the middle of the cause hard test. So what are you going to do? You're going to fill them up with sand, right? Mm -hmm. This was a nature preserve. And so you couldn't use the sand from next to the hole. They had to truck it in about 100 kilometers away to fill up the hole. To I don't know, I, I just didn't fill it The site of Kachumbo I mentioned earlier, I think that I know where the holes are in that image. Um, but as I say, the, the Brazilians are walking back down and saying, we actually didn't have anything about this program. What we told you 20 years ago was actually not going to I mentioned the subsidence craters. What you see there is the bomb goes off at the bottom of the deep hole, comes a great big cavity, melts the earth, presses the earth, 
that county down there can be on the diameter. And what happens is eventually all the dirt just trickles down and boom. And when these subsidences occur, which can occur any time from sometimes within seconds or minutes of the detonation, in other cases it doesn't occur for days or even years. But when it goes off, it's very impressive. Earth rushes in and all that dirt from the flight on top of it. Um, there are many places on the test site where there are fences around places that are kind of rushed. So even years later, you don't know when it is going to be. Because you're women in nuclear, I, I wanted to put some things in there about other stuff that happens. And I bet uh, that we have some people who know a lot about this here, I think. But, uh, Radiochemical guidelines, it's important. You don't just make these uh, measurements with gamma detectors and things and get electrical signal. They actually drill back in afterwards and collect samples from out of the hole. And you can get isotope ratios, they tell you fishing energy, um, you look at the distribution of fishing products, and you look at things like tracers and malfraction indicators, which I'll, I'll describe. This is actually one of the more dangerous parts of this, because usually when they drill back into that cavity, a whole lot of pressure down there, a whole lot of radioactive debris, and when that drill bit breaks into the hole, it's kind of like an oil well blowing out. A whole lot of radioactive and that would allow the things to get out. But things you have to realize are going to transmute, and I think this is, is the case. Let's say that you are an ionized.